Constructed in 1770 to impress the Empress Maria Theresa of Austria, the Turk was a complex automata that seemed to play chess and very frequently beat its human competitors. The device itself was a human torso, the upper part of a human torso, and two arms and a head, and it was dressed as a Turkish sorcerer. The idea was that this was supposed to be some kind of magician, and it was perhaps channeling the dark spirits in order to possess this mechanical body and to give it human-like attributes and human-like propensities for thinking. After its debut in 1770, it was tucked away and put into quote-unquote repair. All indications from the time seem to point at it not actually needing repair, but the developer of the Turk, Wolfgang von Kemplen, preferring to work on his other machinations, his other mechanical projects, and in particular devices that would replicate human speech. But whatever the facts of the matter may be, the Turk itself was put into storage and did not tour until 1783. And even then it was kind of because royalty demanded that he do it. But eventually the Turk did begin to tour and became all the rage in both Europe and then eventually in the Americas. The Turk was presented very much like you might present a magic act today, where it was a full performance and there was a lot of audience engagement. At one point, the Turk played against Napoleon Bonaparte, and though there are mixed reports about what actually happened there, there's some indication that Napoleon tried to trick the Turk in numerous different ways, making false moves, and by some reports even having a bit of cloth draped around the Turk's eyes, which is quite funny because they were fake eyes, obviously, in this fake head atop this fake torso. But nonetheless, every time Napoleon tried to pull a fast one, the Turk would respond in kind, either moving the piece back to its original place if he tried to make a, an illegal move, or in one case, apparently, swiping all the pieces off the board after Napoleon makes a series of illegal moves. The Turk also played a game against Benjamin Franklin, and Franklin himself became absolutely enamored with the Turk and kept a book about the Turk on his shelf until his dying day. And this seemed to be a consistent theme that very intelligent people, thinking people of the time period, the 84 years or so that the Turk toured Europe and the Americas, they became engrossed with the idea of it. And because of the level of science at the time, this was an absolutely fabulous, unbelievable accomplishment that seemed to have occurred in the development of this device. And people wanted to know what the trick was. How had the inventor either developed mechanical intelligence or how had he developed something that was so clever that it could easily be mistaken for human intelligence? That is to say, if it was not actual intelligence that was being replicated here, how had he developed something that seemed so much like human intelligence? Now, the trick with the Turk was that it was not mechanical intelligence. The trick was that there was a human being tucked inside the table upon which the Turk played its match, and it was very cleverly obscured, the place where this person inside the Turk sat. You could open all of the doors on the table and show nothing but mechanical pieces because the person inside could move back and forth so as not to be seen at any given point, and some clockwork looking mechanical innards would be revealed instead. But it was a really simple concept that was well developed and very intelligently presented, and the presentation was really the key to the entire facade. The machine itself was clever because it allowed the person inside to control the hand of the Turk, and in some cases the head, so that the head could nod, for example, when he had put his opponent's 
king in check. But inside, the chess master that was controlling the Turk was only able to see because of a candle. It was not super sophisticated in terms of the actual technology used. It was just intelligent application of that technology. And when it comes down to it, the Turk was what seemed to be a machine acting like a human. But really, it was a human acting like a machine acting like a human. And this is something that we see consistently, even today. Things that seem to be machine intelligence are actually human intelligence that are pretending to be machine intelligence that are pretending to be human intelligences. In 2005, Amazon launched a service called Mechanical Turk, and the service and the name were both inspired by the Turk, the chess playing quote unquote machine. And Mechanical Turk, this service, essentially just breaks complex tasks into smaller component pieces. And these pieces are referred to as HITS, H-I-T, Human Intelligence Tasks. And these tasks then, these, these HITS, are divvied out to humans at their computers. And so there might be thousands of humans working on this one task, but each of them are working on a very small component of it. And these tasks then tend to be things that computers are not good at doing. There are some things that our algorithms and our soft AI is very good at doing. But some things, some things that seem very simple to us, like identifying the difference between colors, machines are not very good at yet. And as a result, it makes more sense for humans to do these things, so long as these tasks can be divvied out in a way that is easy for a human to use and access and quickly click through. And so what we have with Mechanical Turk is a service that is kind of like machine intelligence, but it's powered by human intelligence. And so what we see, again, is that flipping of the funnel, that flipping of the expectation that we assume mechanical intelligence will be something very different from human intelligence. But in a lot of cases, what we actually have is human intelligence obscured by, but also empowered by, and in a way changed by, maybe funneled by, amplified by machine intelligence, and then delivered to a human who can do something with that using their human intelligence. It creates a symbiotic relationship between these different types of intelligences, if we want to call them that, that results in better results than if we would have just had the mechanical intelligence or the human intelligence by itself. And that's the topic that I want to address today. The idea of intelligence, and particularly non-human intelligence, because in a lot of cases when we look at anything that's not human and try to assign or take away intelligence from it, the lines that we're drawing are not quite as clear as they should be, or at least not quite as clear as I think that we assume that they are. And this applies not just to machines, but also to animals and aliens and anything else that we might want to interact with at some point in the future. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. This week's episode of Let's Know Things is brought to you by HostGator. HostGator is the company that I gleefully use for all of my hosting needs. And if you're looking to build a blog or a website or some other kind of online-based project, now is a wonderful time to check them out. If you go to hostgator.com slash LKT, as in let's know things, LKT, you will help support the show, but you will also get a significant discount on all of HostGator's hosting plans. This episode is also sponsored by Audible. If you like podcasts, chances are you will also enjoy audiobooks. They are just great big podcasts, if you think about it. You can find a selection of the books that I've written and narrated on Audible. But if you stick around at the end of this episode, I will also give a book suggestion of something that you might consider checking out. And you can get that book or one of my books or any other book in the massive Audible catalog for free. If you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT, you'll get a free month of Audible and a free audiobook of your choice. 
It's a really great deal and another stellar way to help support the podcast while also getting something excellent for yourself. Thank you very much for your support, and let's get back to talking about non-human intelligence. The article that I want to start from today is from National Geographic, and it's entitled, Do Crows Hold Funerals for Their Dead? And if you read the article, this title is a little bit misleading, as titles seem to be, not in the sense that it's not asking that question and not addressing that topic, but in that there's a whole lot more to this conversation than simply trying to figure out if birds have funerals. And part of the difficulty in thoroughly and concretely writing about this topic is that we're kind of in a golden age of brain research. We've got a bunch of new tools and a bunch of new discoveries that are hitting all at once. And as a result, we're learning essentially every day something new about the way the brain works, the human brain, but also the brains of animals. And so a concept that's very fundamental to understanding the way that we think the mind-body problem is coming to a head. This idea that we don't know where thinking occurs. Particularly right now, we're able to very accurately measure what parts of the brain are most stimulated and active when we think about certain things or do certain activities. But this is not the same as understanding how the brain works. And though we know a great deal, and we know a hell of a lot more than we knew just a few decades ago, this is still very much a mystery, and we've got a whole lot of data supporting a bunch of different directions. But the jury is still out on the absolutes of this. We still can't say with absolute certainty that the way that we think and our conception of thinking and our idea of the world and the way that we see it and how we respond to it that all of these things happen in this specific center of the brain that evolved at this time period and blah, blah, blah. So we can't look at the human brain and say, this is what makes us human. And then look at the animal brain and say, yeah, see, that's missing there. They don't have that part that makes them awesome like us. And so this range of discoveries about the brain and about neurology in general is hitting at the same time as a bunch of different studies in the animal world, when we have studies that have involved looking at animals and looking at their capabilities and looking at the way that they respond to their environments and looking at the way that they interact with each other and other animals and with us. And what's emerged is a situation where we know with more certainty than ever how much we don't know about the brain while at the same time, we're looking around at non-human animals, non-human entities, and recognizing something of us in them. For example, we look at crows, and we see them performing what seem to be funeral-like rites over their dead, or at least recognizing somebody who might be a threat to their group, to their family, to, their, to themselves. We look at crows and magpies using tools. We look at dolphins as they form into pods, interacting with each other and interacting with us in some cases in ways that seem to reek of a certain type of intelligence that may not be human, but certainly smells like human intelligence. It's something that's close enough that it's very, very easy to anthropomorphize, to decide that this is something that is human or human-esque that is happening in their brains. We've been seeing the same in whales, in goats, in elephants, in octopuses. And apparently octopuses is the correct plural for octopus, not octopi, because of its Greek rather than Latin roots. So, fun fact. But we're looking at all of these animals and we're recognizing something that we couldn't see before. Maybe because we wouldn't allow ourselves to see it, but also because we didn't really have the research and the funding and the data. Uh, the ability to merge data with different research facilities that are doing such experiments around the world. And now we have those things. We're able to look at the bigger picture in a way that we hadn't been able to do before and say, huh, maybe there's something here. Maybe there's something that's been there the entire time that we simply haven't recognized for an array of different reasons. 
We're even looking at creatures that we wouldn't typically consider to be intelligent as individuals, and considering that there might be a heretofore unrecognized type of intelligence being displayed, talking about swarm creatures like ants and termites and bees. Perhaps they're not intelligent as individuals. Each individual ant by itself doesn't really have enough going on physiologically for there to be real thought happening. But what if each ant is a component of a larger type of intelligence? What if each swarm is itself kind of like a brain or a body, and each ant is kind of like a neuron firing or a finger or a toe? This is another direction that this research is going, and it's another type of intelligence that we're looking at and saying, huh, maybe, maybe there's something there that we could recognize, if not as a sibling, perhaps as like, you know, a third step cousin or something, something that's similar enough that we can look at it and recognize as one of our own, if not human, as a thinking entity worthy of the same consideration as any other thinking entity, which is a group that right now only includes humans, as far as most of us are concerned. But in addition to the issues of the mind-body problem, which is trying to figure out where the mind, this, this nebulous, perhaps intangible thing, stems from, is trying to figure out what intelligence even is. And the modern idea of intelligence didn't emerge until the 1960s during the so-called cognitive revolution. In the 60s, what we decided is that the mind, this thing that allows us to look at ourselves and say, I am me, separate from my environment, this thing that allows us to imagine and to calculate and simulate and associate, the mind is a set of processes that control complex behavior. And so what we see as this one unified thing, this mind that does everything, is really a set of different behaviors that then we unify. We kind of blur the lines between them as like a latent process in the human brain so that we don't notice the difference between them. We see them as one thing. We see it as an I, an individual acting upon the world and, and being acted upon by the world. We see it this way as opposed to seeing a set of instincts and chemical reactions and electrical impulses and all of these different things happening as individual responses and response patterns, we see it as a collection that adds up to me, adds up to a mind. Now, what's interesting is that the way that we view animal intelligence, typically, even animal intelligence like crows, as described in this article, where they seem to be doing something complex. They seem to be doing something that we can kind of recognize as a human-like intelligent act. We still tend to label it as an animalistic instinct of some kind. It might be complex. It might display some type of cognitive complexity. And it might be something that identifies these animals as so-called goal-seeking agents, which is kind of a fancy way of saying a type of intelligent entity. But it's still something that we consider to be different from us. Even when animals seem to display perception and attention and tool usage and empathy and organizational skills, even the ability to simulate, to imagine, we still don't consider them to be the same as what humans do. We say that when this crow responds to mask wearing people holding a dead crow, which is how the experiment in the article was run, they respond to it because of some kind of animalistic, complex set of instincts, something that has a clear evolutionary benefit. It allows them to work better as groups, it allows them to survive better so that they can pass on their DNA and so on and so forth. It's a very biological description of why this happens. But when we describe very similar things for humans, we tend to drift away from purely biological explanations. It may be that the neurological response pattern is incredibly similar to what's happening on the animal level, but because we blur these lines so thoughtlessly, so casually, and because as a result of blurring these lines, we're able to see these instinctual responses as perhaps conscious decisions that we've gone back and justified and tried to explain later. As a result, the discussion that we have 
about very similar things between two different species are very different conversations. And I think part of the reason that we do this, that we rationalize in this way, that we say that we respond to our dead in the way that we do as humans because of cultural influences and blah, 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 rather than tracing those cultural influences backward and saying, well, why do we do those? Well, perhaps it's the result of a complex set of animalistic instincts that help us survive and pass on our DNA and so on and so forth. It's much more comfortable for us to imbue everything that we do with this layer of intent and this layer of cultural rationalization so that we don't run up against that cognitive dissonance that arises anytime we feel that we are being compared to animals. If, as we look at ourselves more and more closely with the new technology and science that we have, with the new social structures that we have that allow us to do more with this data more quickly, and if with all of that we can't find something that fundamentally separates us from gorillas, from chimpanzees, from crows, from octopuses, from elephants, from swarms of bees, that could very well make us challenge on a species level our existing perceptions about ourselves and how exclusive and remarkable and special we are. Out of all living things, we are the things that are different, are separate. When we have these discussions, the language that we use is that we have human intelligence and non-human intelligence. If we begin to discover that the line between human intelligence and non-human intelligence is not like a stark, dark line between these two very different things, and instead is kind of just two different points on a spectrum or a series of different spectrums, where does that leave us? Where does that leave the way that we respond to each other, the way that we respond to nature, that we respond to other thinking creatures, other life? Where do we draw the line? Do we start giving out the same rights that humans have to every other creature that we can identify as a thinking creature? And at what point do we decide that this type of thinking does not deserve the same rights as this type of thinking? Do we decide that only animals with a certain type of imagination, for example, are our equals legally? Do we decide that only animals that can perform so-called nested thinking the way that we do, which is kind of a meta-thinking, the ability to think about oneself thinking, the ability to simulate things and make connections between things and invent new things based on other existing things? Is that the yardstick that we use to measure whether something is worthy of being considered an equal or at least not a food stock? That last point is a big part of what makes this type of conversation so uncomfortable. Because when we look at our relationships to other animals, what we see is essentially a system of widespread abuse. If you if you look at animals, if you look at the animals that we eat or the animals that we just don't help or treat as equals, what you essentially see is a caste system where we're at the top and everything else is expendable. You don't, in most cases, even get punished if you kill an animal. If you run into a deer with your car, if you eat a goat, if you smash a spider, these are not punishable offenses in most cases. And so if you look at the world if you look at humanity, if you look at our species through the lens of a theoretical future version of our society, in which we've decided that any thinking animal, by any definition of thinking, is equal to a human, imagine how they would look at us. Imagine what their perception would be of our society, how barbaric, how bestial, how horrible we all are. Can we not see how terrible we are being the way that they can through the lens of history and through the lens of their changed sense of morality on the subject? This is part of what makes up the argument for certain types of vegetarianism and veganism, the idea that it is barbaric to treat other living creatures in this way, in the way that we do where we take their eggs and milk, where we kill them for meat. And this is something that hasn't been a seriously practical 
philosophy to hold for a great deal of human history. For most of human history, you take the calories you can get, you take the vitamins, you take the protein, you take the calcium that you can get, wherever you can get it. And if it means that I have to kill some chickens to get it, if it means I have to milk some cows to get it, and breed the cows so that they give more milk rather than so that they're happier, then that's something that we do. It's just been a very practical way to approach that relationship. But now, today, particularly in developed countries, and increasingly all around the world, we have a great number of alternatives to all of these things. We have egg and milk alternatives. We are developing some really, really high quality meat alternatives. And so then the question becomes, is that something that makes us more capable of having this discussion in a serious way? It's understandable, as much as something like this can be understandable, that it would be difficult to have a conversation that could conceivably lead to a wholesale collapse of multiple industries and the way that we interact with the planet on a fundamental level. It would be difficult to have that discussion because if we did decide that this is a terrible, morally repugnant thing that we're doing, then we would have to make those types of changes to remedy that situation or live in a situation where we now recognize ourselves as these horrible actors in the global collective of intelligent species. Today, though, we could actually have that conversation and we could look at real, actionable solutions if we did decide that these different intelligences warrant these types of changes. And so it'll be very interesting to see these conversations as they evolve. I personally do think that there's a lot of good arguments on both sides. I, I do think that particularly as we learn more about these different types of intelligences, even if they're not the same as us, the same as the type of intelligence that we have, it does seem to be recognizable as intelligence, particularly as we aggregate that data the way that we do today. On the other hand, there's some good arguments to be made that ecosystems of all kinds stay balanced because we have different types of creatures eating different types of creatures. And although we definitely kind of changed the rules on a fundamental level when we developed agriculture and ranching and things like that, started to domesticate animals, it's also something that inherently can't be unnatural because we did it. We ourselves are animals and it is something that we did. And so us creating agriculture is no more unnatural than a chimp using a stick to get termites out of the mound or a crow recognizing somebody who seems to have killed another crow and using that knowledge and spreading that knowledge as a defense mechanism. One difficult component of this discussion, and, and there are many difficult components of this discussion, but one that's particularly difficult because it sways the way that we see everything. It, it impacts the data and our perception of the data is the way that we study intelligence. And the difficulty right now is that although we know a lot more about the way the brain works than we did decades before, we still don't fully understand what does what and how and why and how it all fits together into the mind. And so as a result, we can't just scan an animal's brain and say, okay, yeah, it's, it's intelligence. See, this is where the thinking takes place. We can trigger different regions to make different responses occur. We can make things happy and sad. We can control cockroaches, like remote-controlled cockroaches with very, very simple pieces of electronics. These are the things that we can do right now. But when it comes to intelligence, it's still kind of a black box that we don't fully comprehend. And so everything that we know, that we quote-unquote know about animal intelligence, including our own in a lot of cases, comes from the consequences of whatever is happening in that black box. It is the result of thinking, whatever thinking happens to be. And so when we look at octopuses doing these very complex feats, they are changing the color of their skin to camouflage themselves. They are fitting through very tiny holes. They are creating tools to help them escape from aquariums, to get to the pipes that will lead them back to the ocean. These very complex things that we recognize as, and anthropomorphize as human behavior, as something that we can recognize as intelligence. We don't really have any way of knowing that this is a conscious choice on the part of the octopus. All we can do is look at the results and say, hey, that has to be something there. There has to be some kind of thinking occurring, or this animal would not be acting in this way. In reality, though, that's just pure speculation. 
It could be a complex set of instincts, just pure reflexive responsive behavior that is occurring that makes the octopus act in that way. If you could actually measure the thinking that is going on behind that, it could be just a dull hum of white noise. There could be nothing going on there. It could have no sense of self. It could have no sense of its environment. It could be that it doesn't imagine anything. It could be that it just has a very highly sophisticated and complex set of instincts and response mechanisms that result in something that we, as humans, interpret as something that is resplendent of human intelligence. And that's the case across the board. That's the case when we look at orcas and goats and dolphins and mice and rats and, and everything else that we look at and say, huh, this thing seems to be intelligent. Look at what it's doing. Look at the way it's looking at me. Look at the way it responds to these puzzles and the way that it solves this problem and the way that they drag the bones of their dead to this graveyard like elephants do. These are all things that we look at and perceive to be the result, the consequence of intelligence. But we don't know that because the only intelligence that we can know or that we can seem to know if we want to get philosophical about it is our own. And so we're filtering everything that we see animals do through the lens of the human experience. And unfortunately, what that does to us is it leads us where we are now, where we can have a bunch of data and we can do a lot of observation. But for the moment, at least, that's as far as we can go. That does not tell us the mechanism behind these consequences and these actions. So to me, the natural next question that results from that type of information is, does it matter? Does it matter if rats who seem to empathize with each other and help each other out when they are under starvation situation, when they, they give part of their food to other rats and there's no other discernible reason for that other than empathy, does it matter that they might do that for a reason other than the reason that we would do it? Does it matter that they don't actually care and that they don't actually have feelings in the way that we have feelings, but they have a set of programmed animalistic instinctual reflexes or responses that compels them to do this? Does that difference make a difference to us in the way that we respond to these consequences? If a dog seems to be happy and excited to see you, but in reality it's not happy and excited the way that a human would be, it's just programmed to have those types of responses to a certain stimulation, which is you, the person who feeds it and takes care of it, walking through the door. Does it matter that the formula that leads to this result is different than the formula that might lead to a similar result in a human. I don't know. I, this is something that I think everybody could have a different answer to and be equally correct because it is more of a, a human emotional thing than something that we can actually measure. And it's an important thing to think about because the, the fact is that we don't know right now. The mind and thinking is a black box for all intents and purposes at the moment. And that is the same for humans and for animals. And so if we look at these animals and they do things that seem human-like, but they do them for a different reason, does that change our opinion of these animals? Does it change whether or not they are worthy of certain protections that we might want to afford to intelligent or empathizing or feeling creatures? And what does it mean if they do do it for similar reasons that we do? If they do feel, if we do discover, if we have a breakthrough discovery, that allows us to look in the brain of a dog and say, oh, they actually do feel incredibly excited when they see us. Does that change our perception again if we look at them as things that feel and therefore act this way, as opposed to an animal that because of a series of complex instinctual reflexes and responses acts in that exact same way? It's kind of a gut check if you think about it. It's, it's something that whether we take kind of a consequentialist viewpoint on this, that the end results are what matters rather than what leads up to those end results, that will determine a lot of what happens next as we continue to discover more about animal intelligence and more about other types of non-human intelligences as well. And it might even help us decide what type of language to use for it. It may be that some animals do act the way that they do because of similar activity inside of their mind, whatever we determine the mind to be, and others do not. And it may be that that then helps us determine legally how we need to respond to these animals, what types of protection to give to some and not to others, what we can eat morally and what we cannot eat, 
And then that impacts the way that our society operates, the way that we take in nutrients, the way that we respond to our environment and everything else, the way that politics play out. One of the many things that's interesting about this discussion to me is how it overlaps with so many other very important topics of discussion. The way that we respond to animal intelligence or non-human intelligence of the animal variety might also inform how we respond to potential artificial intelligences that arrive, whether they are more of the same kind of artificial intelligence that we have today, these kind of quote-unquote soft AI, where they are not human, they're not thinking, they're not cognizant in the same way that we are, but they are performing very complex tasks and operating in a very similar way, not an exact same way, but in a very similar way to the way that brains act and that we have distributed pieces that do different things and they work together to form a cohesive whole. So whereas a human brain works in such a way that is beneficial to the way a human being needs to operate, Artificial intelligences, the soft AI that we have today, operate using very different inputs and rather than being able to learn like a child where you hear a word a couple of times and then suddenly you have that word associated with different things in your vocabulary, you have to put millions of different inputs into an AI to get it to learn something. But then it's able to use that massive library of things to calculate much quicker than we can and to perform these superhuman-like tasks and calculations that we simply are not built to do. And so it's a different type of intelligence, and it stands to reason then that rather than ending up with like a humanoid robot with an artificial intelligence that's essentially like a human but smarter, instead we'll end up with something more distributed. We'll end up with a quote-unquote AI that lives on all of our devices and inside all of our walls and helps us manage our utilities and helps us manage our data. And it's something that is kind of pervasive, kind of a, a collective intelligence that weaves itself into everything that we do and interacts with us in such a way that it augments our abilities rather than operating completely independently. Almost like a symbiotic relationship between two different types of entities, the AIs that we seem to be developing at least seem to be largely beneficent and seem to be something that can add to us in, in the same way that a bunch of birds perching on a hippo will, will be symbiotic with that hippo by taking some of the scraps of what it eats and in return helping keep the parasites at bay. It's, it's a very imperfect metaphor, but it would work something like that, I think, the way that it's developing. But if we do develop accidentally or through intent something that seems to think in a way that we can recognize as an AI, how do we treat it? Legally, how do we act upon it? This is something that's been played out in so many different science fiction novels and movies and plays over the years that there's a lot of different interpretations of it, and a lot of them are fairly dystopian. There was a movie called Her that came out several years ago that was a really, really interesting take on this because it, it wasn't dystopian or unfriendly or violent in any way. It kind of just maps out the relationship between a normal person living a normal life in a near future scenario with an operating system that becomes an emergent intelligence. It starts to think. And the interesting question that I asked myself throughout that entire movie is whether or not this artificial intelligence actually thought in the same way that the character who was falling for the, the artificial intelligence thought, or if there was simply a complex set of if-then statements and artificial instinctual reflexes and responses that aggregated into something that seemed like emotions and feeling. And then, as a progression of that, does it actually matter if that's the case? If this is something that this entity is doing for the same reasons that we are, or for completely different reasons, but the results are exactly the same? Does it matter and does that help determine the way that we respond to this artificial intelligence? It's the same question that we ask with animals, but it's the same thing that we have to consider with any type of intelligence that we come into contact with. It's the same thing that we'll have to consider with aliens. If we, if we encounter aliens, whether it's microbial life that we encounter in underground water wells on Mars, or if it's intelligence of the Roswell Grays variety that come in their flying saucers down to Earth. Chances are these will be very different intelligences than we are. These will be very different life forms with very different 
backgrounds, both evolutionary and microbial and potentially atomic. They could be based on something completely different than we are, some different type of fundamental molecule. Rather than being carbon-based, they could be silicon-based. Everything about them, their, their entire bodies could be built out of fluids that are poisonous to us and likewise us to them. What type of intelligence emerges from that type of chemistry, from their type of background, from whatever experiences they've had, from whatever technologies they've developed, if any? What does that look like? And if we can recognize intelligence in them, and it's not guaranteed that we will recognize it, even if it's there, how does that impact the way that we respond to them? And then as we're going out there into the universe, how do we recognize these intelligences? We can't even do it here on Earth. And the animals here are insanely similar to us on so many different levels. And so if we can't even recognize or agree on what intelligence is here when we're dealing with things like dolphins and chimpanzees, what happens when we go out into space and we find other planets where there are life forms of some kind that are so small that we can't see them but seem to be thinking and developing technology? Or what happens when we look at planets that the entire ecosystem works together in the way that a termite mound works together. And so they're completing complex tasks in the same way that groups of termites or that even our artificial intelligences do. But they're so fundamentally different and operating at such a different scale that it's hard for us to look at them and say, yes, that is a thinking thing. In the same way that it would be difficult for them, a sw potential swarm intelligence, to look at us as individual creatures and see anything other than a bunch of termites, individual termites that for some reason don't work super well together. Again, super important questions to ask. It's important for how we deal with animals, how we deal with the AI that we're developing, how we deal with other potential life forms that we encounter elsewhere on the planet. There is so much of this planet that has yet to be explored, particularly under the ocean, and there's a great deal of opportunity to come into contact with new types of extremophiles, for example, life forms that can survive in places that we once thought there was no way any life could survive there. So these types of things are foreign to begin with from the way that we typically define the word life. And so it's, it's a step even further than to look at that strange type of life and try to determine what its intelligence might be, how it might operate, what inner machinations might lead up to the type of outward consequences that we can see and measure. There's one other type of intelligence that I wanted to mention here, and it's a little bit obscure. It's usually not a part of this type of conversation, but it, it's really, really interesting to me, and I think something worth considering, so bear with me here. There's a sociological term that I think is really relevant here, and that term is the social organism. And this term refers to the concept that societies as a whole, as an aggregate of everything within that society, is a type of organism. And it's an organism that's held together and maintained by the invisible societal structures that allow each of the individual components within that structure to interact and to grow and evolve and to meet the larger needs of that social entity. That is to say that groups of people and all of our associated wealth and knowledge and resources and power and economics and politics and our biological relationships with other species and our legal relationships with other species and everything about us, both tangible and imaginary, the imaginary structures that we have imagined together and agreed upon to try to organize ourselves and to interact better so that everybody benefits from it. This all adds up to a larger, more complex organism. And this organism sometimes interacts with other organisms, sometimes those of a similar size, for example, a nation state interacting with another nation state, sometimes against something much smaller, like a nation state against an individual or a small organization that lives within that nation state or within another nation state, and then sometimes something much bigger. It could be like a global collective, a global society that is acting against a small colony somewhere that is operating outside of that global society. And this idea of the social organism, it, it's an intellectual exercise, I think, in most ways. It's something that's really, it's a good shortcut for thinking about some of these things and the way that we organize and the way all of these different things, both tangible 
and imaginary that we've come up with. It's a good way of thinking about how they interact with each other and how we might address the whole, the result, the consequence of these things, as opposed to all the little tidbits that add up and aggregate to that larger organism. But it's not completely beyond the realm of possibility to imagine a sort of like mega biology emerging out of something like this, and perhaps even already existing if we simply looked at it the right way. It's not completely out of the realm of possibility, particularly as we continue to more closely interact with and work together with each other because of the technology that we have developed and the social structures that largely protect us as we do it, to imagine like a planet working together as a superorganism. And that when you look at the planet as a whole, in a lot of ways it looks very much like a human body, which is an aggregate of different organisms that work together, different types of bacteria and viruses and parasites and human cells and other types of cells that we've adopted into our DNA over the generations. And all of these things working together as a super organism that sees itself as an individual. And it may not be that this type of global superorganism would have to be able to look at itself and say, I am a planet or, or something dramatic like that. But it could be that in practice, this would be how this type of superorganism would operate. It would operate for many intents and purposes the same way that a human superorganism or a nation state superorganism would operate, in that each of the pieces that aggregate to create the whole work together in a lot of cases not to protect themselves first, but to protect that superorganism first for the survival of the body, for the survival of the nation state, for the survival of the planet. It would be kind of the way that we tend to look at termite mounds or beehives, and we look at them typically not as a collection of individuals because each organism by itself is not that impressive when taken as an individual bee or an individual termite. But by working together, they do really impressive, complex things. And it's easy to look at the termite mounds in Africa and just be blown away and to say, okay, these things are not just stupid bugs. There's something thinking happening here. There's something fundamentally different that in aggregate these things are not just bugs. These things are able to accomplish so much more than the individual insects can account for. And I like to think that the same is true for us. The same is true for we human beings and for the other flora and fauna that are in our ecosphere and any types of intelligence that we might develop technologically. And the intelligences, frankly, that we've developed through our social structures, the collective intelligences that emerge as a result of society and the way that we interact with each other. Looking at our planetary ecosphere as an organism in this way allows us to see that there's a lot that can be done to improve the overall health of the way that we interact with ourselves and increasingly, I think, the way that we interact and influence our planetary neighborhood outward. And I think that's only natural. I think it's also potentially a very, very good way to approach this larger discussion, because it allows us then to look at ourselves and everybody else around us and these other intelligences around us as well, and not to see entities that are completely separate from us, but rather to see other entities that are potentially thinking in the way that we would recognize it as such and potentially not, but to see them as valuable assets as part of the same community that we're in, even if it's this like mega community that you don't necessarily see or think about just on a day-to-day -day basis. And as humans, we can look at our bodies, which is itself a super organism, and figure out ways to make ourselves healthier, to make ourselves better, both on the physical level and on the mental level, whatever mental happens to be, whatever we discover that to actually mean scientifically. We can feel and operate in a much healthier and more productive way. Now, I don't know what the global equivalent of working out and eating a better diet and meditating might end up being, but I do know that there's very little chance that we'll ever discover what that means if we don't begin to look at the world in that broader context. <music> Thank you.
This episode of Let's Know Things was brought to you by a couple of different sponsors and just one note that I like to give anytime I talk about sponsors or affiliates or anything of that nature. Do not buy things or sign up for things just to buy or sign up for things. That is not something that I tend to encourage. I am not a big fan of the consuming just to consume culture. But if something that I point you towards is something useful, something that you were thinking about doing or something that you think would add to your life, the reason that I have sponsors on this podcast is because they are things that I would recommend to you anyway. If you asked me my opinion on whatever, I would tell you what I actually use or what I would recommend for your particular situation. And because they help support the show, it helps me pay the bills. And when you sign up for a free month of something, or when you choose to do business with somebody that I have as a sponsor, then that monetarily benefits the show and helps me continue to make it and focus more of my time on it. And so the sponsors for today's show are two sponsors whose products I have used for ages. The first one is Audible. I was incredibly skeptical about audiobooks for a while because I love reading, but I have found numerous different situations in which audiobooks fill a great big gap in my life that I would totally miss them if they weren't there now. If you listen to podcasts, then you will probably enjoy listening to audiobooks because they are essentially just like really long podcasts with a bunch of different episodes on a particular topic. And you can get a free month of Audible, which is the biggest collection of audiobooks in the world, plus a free audiobook of your choice if you sign up at audibletrial.com slash LKT. And I've got a bunch of my books on Audible. Uh, I've got considerations and some thoughts about relationships and my most recent narrative nonfiction book, Come Back Frayed. But the book that I would recommend in particular this week, and I try to do a book recommendation anytime I have Audible as a sponsor, is the new book by Kevin Kelly, which is called The Inevitable. And for those of you who are not familiar with Kevin Kelly, he was one of the founding editors of Wired. He's written a bunch of different books on a bunch of different topics. He was involved in technology and computers and virtual reality and cybernetics before anybody else, like before it was cool. He was one of these founding geeks behind modern geek and technology culture. And he continues to write about this and speak about this and talk about this all the time. He just has such incredible insight derived partially from being involved in this culture for so long and seeing the shifts that have occurred already. But also he's, he's just got an amazing ability to imagine what happens next. And his last book uh, that was written a handful of years ago, What Technology Wants, was about how technology and humanity and the way that we interact with each other and socialize are intertwined. This book, The Inevitable, just came out and it focuses on 12 different technological imperatives, different facets of this technological revolution that we're going through that are going to heavily influence, in particular, the next 30 years. And so he makes a bunch of predictions about all of these different facets of life that will be impacted for the next three decades. What, what I really love about it is that he, he explains why he believes these things, and he explains how they will influence not just technology, but culture and humanity and the way that we interact with one another. But then he also gives an example of what life will look like probably 30 years from now, the way that this will impact the way that we consume media, the way that we interact with each other, our relationship with our technology and our devices. His work is always an excellent guide to the way things might go. And he's not right 100% of the time. You know, nobody can be right 100% of the time. But he is as close as I've found to a prophet within technology uh, of anybody writing on the subject today. He just gets so many things so right or close to right that it's boggling. And this book makes a massive number of predictions that I certainly hope come true. So it's very much worth reading, very much worth understanding. It's 20 some odd dollars if you buy it by itself, but you can use this free trial to get it for free if you would like and enjoy it as much as I have. And you can get that by going to audibletrial.com slash LKT. And the other sponsor for today's show is HostGator. HostGator is the hosting company that I have used for ages. Hosting is a service that is required if you want to have a website or a blog or some other presence on the internet beyond social media. It is a really 
cheap and easy way to essentially have a space that you own on the internet. And they've got a bunch of entry-level plans that are anywhere from a couple bucks up to something like $10, I think, for different levels. Super cheap, super easy to get started if you just want to build a website or a portfolio site or something along those lines. Some of them have pre-built options where you can get one-click WordPress installation and things of that nature. I personally use their reseller account, which is a little bit more expensive, but super cool because they, they give you a great big plot of land that you can divvy out into a bunch of different projects if you like. That really works for me and the way that I approach my passions and different experimental projects that I like to undertake. Their prices are already good to begin with. I happily pay them each month for the services that they provide, but they will give listeners of Let's Know Things somewhere between 30 and 45% off of all of their plans. So if you go to hostgator.com slash LKT for Let's Know Things, LKT, you will see these discounted prices and you can check it out and see if they have something that suits a project that you're thinking of undertaking or the website that you know you need to build for your business or some kind of random passion project that you want to undertake and put out there on the internet for everybody else to enjoy and see. I have been recommending them to people for years and years and years without getting a cent out of it. They have now offered to pay me for every single person who comes in and signs up with them as a result of hearing this message on this show. So it's a great way to support both the podcast and to get something that you actually want. And I feel very, very good about recommending them here because of the incredible service that they provide. So again, that's hostgator.com slash LKT. A great way to establish a foundation for whatever new projects you might want to undertake while also supporting the show. So going and checking out those sponsors is a great way to support the show. You can also support Let's Know Things directly. A huge thanks to everybody who is already doing this, who's giving a buck a show, who's giving more, who, who's setting up recurring monthly payments. It is all so very much appreciated. And I get a little message every time one of those comes through, whether you go through PayPal or Venmo or whatever, that makes me smile. Just a great big smile across my face every time it happens. Sometimes I'll, I'll get a message on my phone and I'll be out in public and I'll just get this big goofy grin on my face because it feels so good to know that there's people out there who care about this project enough to give money to a stranger on the internet. So I, I really, truly appreciate it. If you're not already and you'd like to contribute directly to the show as well, you can go to letsknowthings.com and find a couple of links that you can click on that make it really easy to do so. Also on the website, there is a form where you can subscribe to the Let's Know Things newsletter, which goes out every Monday and is a collection of lovingly curated links of interesting things to read from me. And you will also find show notes for every single episode of Let's Know Things on that website. If, if you haven't been checking these out, it's really worth doing. It takes a great deal of time to put it together each time. I'm somebody who hated doing bibliographies in school. And as a result, I try to make these very interesting. It's not just links to places where I found things. It's additional information on top of what I talk about in the podcast itself. You can find out more about me and find a link to my other projects on colin.io. Buying one of the books that I've written is another great way to support me and my work. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. You can find my YouTube show at considerthis.io. You can find me personally everywhere on social media from Twitter to Snapchat at Colin is my name. And you can find Let's Know Things on social media as well at Let's Know Things. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you especially for listening all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. And I will talk to you again next week. Mm -hmm.